Okay, this, this is going to be chapter four's lecture, and this is a short lecture uh, because I just am going to highlight a few things using the PowerPoints, and then I'm going to spend some time in the exercises on a different video. So the first thing is that you know that the whole PowerPoint pack is up on Canvas, but I'm just pulled out a few of the slides that I want to explore a little further and highlight. Okay, so the, the thing is this chapter is pulling in some concepts about things we've already learned, like making the adjustments at the end of the period or closing out the books for the period. And um, it's just bringing out some things that come to light because we added the merchandises where uh, the merchandise issues, because when we first learned about adjusting entries and about closing entries, we were working with a service industry instead of the merchandise. And so I'm just gonna add some concepts about the complications that might arise, Not, nothing too serious. So let's see what we can do. For some reason, my slideshow is not wanting to cooperate. There we go. Okay, so this is just one thing that happens then that um, in this chapter, well, when we add merchandise at all, we have rather than um, when we have a purchase of merchandise, we, uh, we debit the merchandise inventory if we're on the perpetual system and we we debit the purchases account if we're on the periodic system but in both cases we credit either the accounts payable or the cash and then when we make the sale we debit the accounts receivable and cash and we credit sales just like always no matter what the method is we credit the revenue account we debit it either accounts receivable or cash so that really hasn't changed um and so the next thing um the thing that it, it did change too of course when we're when are we starting um, merchandising is when you make a sale in the perpetual system, rather than just the sale, you have to also record the costs related to it. And so we talked about that a little bit in another chapter. Okay, so then another thing that's changed is when you look at um, the, the income statement and you pull that from your end of period spreadsheet, you have some new accounts. And so you have to come up with what is the net amount of the purchases in order to get that show up on the, um, the income statement. So you'd wind up pulling from your end of, uh, period spreadsheet, these last two columns into the income statement with sales, then reducing it by the uh, sales returns and discounts, or returns and allowances to get a net sales number and then reduce that by the total cost of goods sold to get to your gross profit. And the, the total cost of goods sold involves this somewhat lengthy uh, calculation of cost of goods sold that starts with the beginning inventory, and then you add in your purchases. But purchases could have, here's the amount we bought, plus we had returns related to the purchases. Then we had uh, discounts, cash discounts that were offered toward the purchases. So then we would wind up with an extra amount, a net amount that we had bought of the goods and add that to our beginning inventory to come up with how much of the goods that were available. And then of the months that are available, we've talked about this in a previous uh, uh, slide also, or in a previous chapter, sorry, um, the goods available are either in one of two places. They're either still here in our inventory, so they're in our ending inventory, or they're in cost of goods sold. So they either got sold or they didn't. If they got sold, they sh their cost should be in cost get sold. If they did not get sold, their cost should be in the ending inventory. And so that's really not a change from a previous chapter, but it's changed from back there where we were using the end of period spreadsheet to do the entries and to do the ending financial statements. So you just have to pull all these things that have you accumulated data for into your income statement to get it to come out correctly. And we're going to work some of those in the exercises. Okay, now there's this other thing that they're bringing up in this chapter about unearned revenue regarding the um, merchandising company or really anything. I don't think we discussed unearned revenue very much when we were initially talking about adjustments, but I think I probably mentioned that it would come along eventually because it, it tends to do that. Okay, so basically unearned revenue is a liability account. It's confusing a little when you think of the words unearned revenue, but what it means is the customer has given you cash in advance. You have not earned it yet. So you can't record it as revenue. You have to instead say, okay, I'm going to record this 
Because like when they give you something in advance, they give you your payment in advance, they give you cash. You're having to debit cash to show that you received it. And you're crediting account that normally you would credit it to a revenue. But it's not time to report it yet because you haven't earned it. So an unearned revenue gets recorded with that name. That was really nice of them to give that name, in my opinion. Because when it says the word unearned, that reminds me this is not a revenue account. This is a liability account because I still owe this customer the service related to this or the goods related to this. So unearned revenue is when the customer has given you cash in advance and you have to have a way to record it. So you debit cash to record the cash coming in. You credit unearned revenue to say, hey, I still have to give them this thing. And so that's why it's a liability. You owe the customer the goods that you promised them. Or in the case of a service company that had unearned revenue, they would owe their customer the service that they promised. And so we have, I just want to remind you about these three ways that we could report revenues. And so one is we could just uh, do service or, or give product to our customer and they give us the money for it. And so that's this first one. That's earn it now, collect it now. You would debit cash, you would credit the revenue account. Piece of cake, we know what to do with that. Then the next one, we know what this one does too, because we've been talking about it since the day one, pretty much. And that is we could earn it now, but not collect it yet. So earn now, collect later. That's when we record it with a debit to accounts receivable and a credit to the revenue account. So this work, both of these one and two and three work for revenues that are related to merchandise or not. It's just they chose this check to start talking about this a little bit deeper. And so if it's service or if it's merchandise, either way, if we sell it right now and get the money right now, we're going to just record it with dip to cash and credit to revenue. If we sell it now and we get a promise that they're going to pay it next month or sometime in the near future, then we're going to debit accounts receivable. We're going to credit the revenue, just like we've talked about all term. No matter whether it was services or it was good, that's the way we record it. So we know what to do there. Now, the third thing that we're going to do, we're going to pick up now is, well, what about if we're earning it? Sorry, I'm having trouble because my screen is covered up. There we go. Okay, we earn it later, but we collected it now. So this is the scenario I was just talking about, about the unearned revenue. So in that case, you debit cash, you credit the unearned revenue account. So it could be related to, to uh, services or related to goods. But basically, you're saying it's not time to record that as revenue yet. So I can't. I can't put it in the revenue or the sales count um, or, or even the fees earned or whatever account you call your service income. I can't record it as income because that would not be appropriate if I haven't provided the goods or services. And so that's why I have to say, if it's earned later, but it's collected now, then I'm going to dip cash to show the collection and I'm going to credit unearned revenue. So that unearned revenue is a liability account. So this is the part we got to make sure we don't lose that's coming a, a little clearer in this chapter. Okay, we'll do some exercises about that too later. I'm going to get this thing to work. My slideshow, it's just trying to be a little bit contrary. Okay, all right. So now I've got this chart of accounts that's in our textbook and they had highlighted the ones they added it, when they added merchandise. And so you'll see those highlighted in red, the merchandise inventory count, and then they have an account called estimated returns inventory that some people use to make an estimate of the returns that are going to be there. And it's not actually commonplace in practice. And so I'm not really highlighting that account 135 very much or its little partner, um, which went right over here somewhere. Oh, this customer refunds payable 203. I don't generally see that in public practice and so what we're going to do is just let let them talk about that in the chapter but I'm not going to emphasize it so chapter uh, accounts 135 and 203 those are related to uh, entries that you could make to true up your financial statements but it's not like you see it every day and so it's um as we go further in accounting in another class you'll probably pick some more information up about this uh, but for now I'm just going to leave it what we're going to do is we're going to think about adding merchandise inventory during this uh, merchandising. We're going to talk about unearned revenue that's added in this merchandising um, and the adjustments. And then the other accounts that relate to merchandising, which of course just means reselling goods that you bought, is sales, which instead of 
fees earned or some other kind of revenue account. We use sales now. And then we have the sales returns and allowances, which is a contra account. And then we have, um, we could have other kinds of revenue, like in this case, in this chapter, they introduced the subscriptions revenue for because they had sold subscriptions to some kind of magazine, I think it was. And then, so if you had another revenue source, you would add it there. And then um, cost of goods sold includes all the purchases plus the returns on the purchases and the discounts uh, uh, the, that the seller offered us. On, uh, for paying early and that such thing. And then it also includes the freight that we had to pay to get the purchases ready to sell. So these things are all part of cost of goods sold. And then they added also interest expense, which, which honestly could have been there in the service industry, but that's just what they added in this chapter, okay? All right, so now this, this is just a comparison of the entries that will be required if you use periodic versus perpetual. And these are transaction entries and the differences between them. We already looked at this a lot. So when you purchase merchandise, you know that when you use a, a periodic system, you debit purchases. That's what we mainly learned. But we just mentioned that if it were perpetual, we would be using merchandise inventory for every transaction. And then if we had returns, Rather than crediting purchases, we would credit merchandise inventory if it was perpetual. And rather than crediting purchases, if it were periodic, we would be credited purchase returns and allowances. And then um, the sales returns and allowances is an, an account for, uh, per, for um, periodic. And it also is for perpetual. But the difference was that periodic, since it's um, only tallying up the inventory at the end of the period is not going to worry about replacing the goods back into inventory if you had a sales return, whereas um, merchandise inventory is kept up to date on the perpetual system. So if you had a sales return, you would have to go ahead and record it as increasing the inventory again to get it correct. And then um, also a customer uh, another kind of customer return. And this was, was when it was sold in a prior period. And that would be affecting that estimated returns inventory, which I'm not really digging into during this uh, chapter. All right, and then at the year end, uh, the adjustments that would be made uh, on a periodic system, you would have uh, close out your merchandise inventory account. Um, and then in, in the perpetual, you, well, you would adjust your merchandise inventory, I'm sorry, for the, to close out the um, beginning inventory into the income summary and then put in the ending inventory. Another alternative would be, of course, you could just take the difference between the two of them and adjust it as part of your purchases to, um, to into, into income summary. But basically you have to put the inventory that was sold into your um, cost related to this period. And so that's why he closed out that part. You close out the you shift, basically. The beginning inventory gets shifted over to a cost for this period. And the ending inventory gets pulled out as reserve for a cost that's going to show up in next period's in, um, income statement. Okay, but if you were perpetual, you would already have been doing that as you went along every transaction. And so only thing you would make an adjustment for at the end of the period is if some of the inventory was missing or um, defective. And so that's why this inventory shortened over is the entry that's being made. Um, and then this, this second entry is that they have here is about the estimated returns, which of course I told you I'm not really emphasizing, so I'm gonna pass over that one. And then the third one is the adjustment for sales returns and allowances that also, um, is um, expected. So uh, that would be part of their estimate of what they expect to be returned on the sales side. Um, and so I'm not actually going to that one either. But anyway, so that's good for that. I just want to show you that we really already know a lot of this, but it's just kind of, we have to take that last step to see, well, what happens at closing that's different than what we expected. Okay, so here's an example of that uh, inventory shrinkage I was talking about. Um, or defective inventory will be done the same way. Uh, you just look at the, the actual count and see how it compared to what you had in your merchandise inventory balance. And the difference would have to be adjusted as, a, as an expense. And they use the account called inventory over and short or short and over. 
it could also be called a lot of other names like inventory um, obsolescence, inventory uh, loss. There's a lot of different terms you could use, but this textbook uses the term inventory short and over, which just means the inventory that's not there that we expected to be there. When we did the count, we thought it would perfectly agree with what we had in the account merchandise inventory because we have been tracking it on a perpetual system every transaction and making a journal entry record the cost every time we made an entry for the sale. But it doesn't always happen exactly like that, where it comes out where the counts matches perfectly. And when it doesn't, we have to figure out why. And when we sometimes we can identify very clearly, oh, well, this were just defective items that we couldn't still still keep in our current inventory. So that would be a form of obsolescence or um, inventory loss. And so that's whatever the amount is, as long as you can chase down approximately what it, what caused it. You just make a journal entry and record it as an expense at that point. And that's what they've done here with this entry, debiting inventory short and over. Okay, so that is all of those um, slides. And I'm gonna work some exercises that'll help yeah, get you some more information about what we're learning in this chapter.